Thanks for joining us in this session. <laughs> this session is supposed to speak about open data and parliaments. And we have a very good representation of different experiences that we hope this can help to a, a conversation that might lead us to answer the questions that we have in this area. I'm Hernan Larraín. I'm senator from Chile. I chair the Bicameral Commission on Transparency of the Chilean Congress. And I also lead a network of parliamentarians who are concerned with promoting transparency in our region. And also with Scott Hobley, we co anchor the legislative uh, working group on parliamentary openness that uh, from the OGP is trying to as well promote these ideas. Parliaments are certainly relevant institutions to our democracies. And despite that, uh, probably in the face of the people, uh, there are institutions that probably have not adapted themselves to the rhythm of the changes that technology has produced in our society. The legislative process in itself uh, tends to be slow, uh, in closed doors, and it happens to be uh, with an outcome that is very abstract, like the bills, laws are not very funny, no? Nothing easy to understand. So there is a distance with what's going on in a world where people is well educated and tremendously well informed. Therefore, there is this gap that uh, we've been trying to open it and trying to make ourselves uh, not only relevant, but clear to the people uh, outside the Congress to interact more. And therefore, we've been promoting different kinds of legal tools to ensure transparency, access of information, uh, different bills trying to avoid conflicts of interest, and so on. Even though parliaments are seen in a very bad way, they're mistrusted, uh, the credibility is very low, and I'm sure that's not uh, something going only in my country or in the majority of country. I'm sure in this room, if we made a survey, probably the parliaments would be very low in the prestige of the institutions. So we wonder what's going on and what can be done, because Congresses are really relevant for democracy. And we want to ensure the quality of democracy. We want to make sure that they fulfill their efforts and that citizens can believe that what's going on in the parliaments is something good for their quality of life. So we're uh, issuing these questions, thinking in that open data is, again, a way that can be helpful to cross this gap, to bridge this problem, seen from the parliament point of view, but also from different areas, as the experience of different countries, seen from different CSOs that have been tracking this uh, problem in the, in the last years. And after this brief introduction, I wanted to leave the floor to Honorable Joe Preston from Canada, that he can tell us how he's been dealing with this issue, how the Canadian Parliament or what his experience from the Parliament side is doing in order to uh, ensure that through uh, open data and through other uh, initiatives from the parliamentaries are conscious about this thing and what we're trying to do, what they're trying to do to bridge this problem. Oh. Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Above and beyond, I've chosen a prof profession that is judged very lowly, apparently. Um, and uh, and 
as a parliamentarian uh, here in Canada, uh, o over 11 years as a parliamentarian here in Canada, I also uh, chair the Procedure and House Affairs Committee here in Canada, so I have a uh, kind of a hands-on relationship with the distribution of information that happens in Parliament and ensuring that that information is available to the public and as quickly and as accurately and in as high a quality as it can be. Um, I also chair the uh, Parli uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association here in Canada and uh, collectively in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association we've been looking at a number of good governance issues and open data of course is one of those. Open Parliament is one of those. We've uh, been coming up with, it's, uh, with a code of conduct for parliamentarians across the Commonwealth and the parliaments that they represent in minimum standards as to openness and accountability and transparency. And specifically, I've been through the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association here, been working on a twinning of parliaments um, with Canadian provinces and territories and the uh, Commonwealth Caribbean nations. Um, the twinning of parliaments at the parliament level, not the parliamentarian level, um, to, to share best practices, to share what is working best in any of those jurisdictions with all of the others. And we're trying to, as we move forward that in the early stages, include open data, including open parliament, as kind of a way of heading forward. It's a, a way of sharing um, information and knowledge with those that are interested in the political process, they tend to be very, very interested. And so making data available to them that is meaningful, not in quantity, because boy, I'll tell you, we push quantity of data up here like you wouldn't believe, but in quality, in the, in the information that people want um, in, a, in a system different than just plain access to information and request to access to information, but allowing data to be available. Um, on a personal note, I may... Uh, 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 I've been married 40 years to my to my wife. I uh, recently had our first grandson. I didn't. I now have one. Um, so I'm a professional grandfather also. And that's uh, the story of, of what I do for a living. Thank you, Joe. Uh, let me ask you a question. Yes. Is, um, is uh, the, the Canadian Parliament uh, open to access of information, right? Yes. But access of information is not the same to open data, no. and you, you, you are working with open data in the way you deliver information? Yes. I mean, I think we have to think of all of these as different ways of being accountable. Certainly, access to information is, is one way. It's a specific question you know, that you can get an answer back, and it's what the answer is. Uh, open data is more, the data is available, and it's, and it's there for use of those who want to go look at it. Um, uh, Minister Clement and the, and the Treasury Board here in Canada have been moving forward in a significant way um, towards open government and open data. The, the answer is technology is running far, far faster than the traditions of Parliament can, can move to keep, keep up. Um, many of us are, are, are trying to, um, if not drag it faster, move it towards the uh, technology that's available now. Uh, if people can sit in their own home on their own device um, and come up with a request for data, and it should be available to them. Those are the answers they should be able to get about their parliament. Maybe, per, you know, whether it's about their parliamentarians or not, that's, that's the judgment part. But the, uh, the governments collect a vast amount of data, and it is paid for by the people and therefore should be available to the people. Thank you, Honorable Preston. Well, let us ask Buka Cerniansky. Did I pronounce it well? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> from Serbia. Really great job. I think, Buka, uh, one of the concerns that from the parliamentary side is how to engage people in what we're doing. Uh, because uh, communication is both ways. We try to communicate. Probably we don't do it very well. We don't give all the information it's requested. But how should this be done? How can we engage more citizens with initiative participating in the legislative or the political process? 
Thank you uh, for that question. And I have to say at the very beginning, it's really great pleasure to be here, but also to sit with parliamentarians who talk about accountability and open data and the benefits, because it's not always like that. I'm coming from Serbia. Um, my organization is advocating for accountability. And you can imagine how is doing um, uh, certain work, like advocating for accountability, when you don't have a translation for accountability. So it's a pioneer work and we think that a parliament is actually the basis for accountability. Um, so what we uh, did, and that's very important to say at the very beginning, that three years ago in Serbia we didn't have data on, for example, plenary sessions and discussion on the plenary sessions. So when we asked for those data, they, they told us to come, for example, we asked six months, um, for the period of six months, data from plenary session, but also uh, the voting records. And they told us you know, like to come with a minivan. Uh, to pick up those data. So things, it, we understand, of course, this is a process, but uh, just uh, three years after, um, we have now all data uh, online. So what we have succeeded as parliamentary monitoring organization, we succeed to push parliament in Serbia to publish all those uh, plenary uh, discussions. Uh, uh, and we today, we have like uh, more than 200,000 speeches uh, uh, on opening parliament website. Also, so um, when we talk about the parliament, and I think that's very important about engaging citizens, it's actually that all of us need to understand what's the role and function of the parliament. So, for example, representation, uh, oversight role, and that actually when we talk, you know, like PMOs and and uh, uh, MPs, uh, we say we we uh, uh, make a certain tension uh, among us. But actually, we are the best allies, you know, especially uh, regarding open data. So um, when we started asking for data, we, of course, uh, uh, made this demand side. And we knew that the benefit will have uh, citizens, uh, civil society organizations, media. But actually, at the end, we realized of this process that the best allies are MPs, because we actually help MPs to make informative uh, decisions. So together, um, I just like want to make this reflection on Serbia, that together we can really like uh, push those uh, obstacles and to, to, to have these you know, like, uh, really data for citizens that they, when you make a decision that you make really taking care about the citizens' need. Uh-huh, yeah. You <coughs> that, uh, citizens are following what you are doing. Are they understanding more of the legislative process? Are, are they... Uh, satisfied with the answers that the, we are giving, or parliamentarians? It's an important giving? question you, you, you uh, raise. I think it's up to all of us to help citizens to understand. So one of the things that we helped in Serbia is also uh, help media to make uh, those yeah, decisions that you actually made in, in the parliament more understandable for, for citizens. Unfortunately, in Serbia, when we talk about media, uh, it's more like yellow uh, journalism in place. And uh, with those data that we collect, we help them to make more responsible journalism. You know? And then I think that's the way how we can help citizens uh, together to better understand and become more engaged in, in your work. Thank you. Chaksu, Chaksu Roy from India. I think you have lots of experiences to tell us, and probably one of those is the work that you've been doing with the media, which is a very important uh, part of our society today, not only with the parliament, but in, in every day society. Probably you can tell us something about the issues we are discussing and put a point on this uh, particular experience that you've developed. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think I'll start by, uh, you know, uh, 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 in his opening remarks, uh, uh, you know, when Senator Larin was talking about, he used a phrase, and the phrase that he used was uh, that uh, parliaments haven't really adapted to the rhythm of change that's happening in society. Uh, uh, and because of that difference between society and what parliaments are doing, uh, 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 across the world we are seeing a certain amount of discontentment or indifference with the political process. Uh, uh, it, is, it is reflective in many ways. One of that is 
uh, rise of uh, new political parties uh, which have a very focused agenda. In India, we have had a political party which has come out of the blue, you know, won a number of seats uh, in the provincial elections. Uh, I think the other, you know, way in which this indifference is shown is, uh, uh, is the way that uh, uh, the conversations around open data uh, with reference to parliament and with reference to citizen engagements are, are being talked about. Uh, I, I'll pick up one specific example. Uh, uh, parliaments uh, uh, across the world uh, do extremely technical and complicated things, right? I mean, they make legislation across a range of subjects. Uh, it could be education policy on one day, it could be electricity on the th second, and internet on the third. Uh, now, making that information available uh, uh, is not simply a question of putting it into an accessible format. Uh, complicated information needs to be broken down so that people can understand it and then, you know, engage with it. Uh, so parliaments at one level either don't put out information or, you know, ask people to come with a minivan, you know, and bring a whole definition, uh, different definition to the information pipeline. Uh, or what they do is uh, they just put out a PDF and say, you know what, Here's a bunch of data. Go figure it out what it means for you. Uh, so uh, accessible information. However, whenever parliaments put out information, uh, which is easy to understand, right? Uh, it is used extensively. Uh, uh, any number of expense scandals across the world uh, uh, are basically due to the fact that uh, if you put out information about how many flights a member of parliament took or what was his expenses in his office, you can make sense of that information, and uh, when you make sense of that information, you can use that very well. Uh, possibly that is what uh, you know, uh, Wuka was referring to when she was talking about yellow journalism. Uh, so one is, uh, you know, can we think about making information accessible uh, uh, beyond the low-hanging fruits of uh, you know, how much work members of parliament are doing and stuff. Uh, coming to media, uh, uh, let's recognize uh, the fact that uh, uh, our friends in the media deal with, uh, you know, increasing number of challenges, right? Uh, they have a number of things on their plate. Uh, uh, they have limited time to turn around things or stories. Uh, uh, clearly, the institution of parliament is not putting out information which is in a way which they can digest and, you know, do something quickly. Uh, in India, a piece of legislation uh, would normally run into about 50 pages of legalese uh, uh, that, you know, a, a bunch of government lawyers have taken three months to put together. Now imagine a, a journalist to make sense of it in three hours before his deadline is. Uh, so there's a role for parliament there, and there's a role for organizations which work with parliamentary data uh, as intermediaries to make the data uh, accessible. Now that access could be what sunlight does, uh, by uh, you know alerting you about as to when a certain piece of legislation is coming up, or what you're doing in making that, uh, uh, making actually the text of the debate accessible. Uh, what we do in PRS is not only do we make the text of the debate accessible, but like a one-page summary in plain English, you know, uh, that can be understood. So uh, I think there is an opportunity for parliaments, uh, and there's an opportunity for media and for civil society organizations to be on the same page when it comes to access to information. Uh, and that access uh, could be well served for parliaments if they made information available so they, they don't get subject to yellow journalism. It would serve well for citizens who so far have not engaged with the legislative process as much as they would. You know, uh, my mother half the times won't want to engage with parliamentary information because it doesn't impact her. But the moment you talk about tax rates on, uh, on electricity going up, you have her attention, right? So, you know, if you package information well, you know, you'll have a much better audience. Thank you. Question of uh, language, definitely. Yes. But thinking in India, of it's so large population, probably there's more population in India than the whole Americas together. Uh, how do you manage uh, illiteracy in, in this field? Because probably you have... Uh, a good number of people with no access to internet like we have in our country. Almost half of our population doesn't have an access to internet, so no way of getting into what parliaments are doing. Well, hopefully, Senator, we were hoping that public representatives could fill that gap and make that information to people. <laughs> but uh, uh, apart from that, I think uh, uh, 
uh, in any society when there is a gap between people and uh, access to information, either through technology, uh, you know, there are innovative ways uh, that come across, right? Uh, earlier in the day, uh, there was talk about uh, leapfrogging from landlines to cell phones. Uh, in the plenary, somebody was talking about it. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, in in country like India and in other countries in Africa, uh, there is a bigger uptake, uh, if not on the internet, on mobile phones. Uh, there are a number of organizations which run programs about accessing your uh, the records of your senator or congressman on their phones. You know, based on your PIN code. So, for in India, we have a service. Uh, all you have to put in is uh, you know your zip code or a PIN code, and it'll tell you who your you know senator or congressman is, where can you reach him or her, and you know what has he been doing in Parliament. So. Chek Su. Now we turn to our left. Regina Amamfo from Ghana. We are interested in knowing also your experiences. And we were speaking about the engaging people and putting the media. But also in, in, in the panel this morning, uh, your colleague Jacob was speaking about what about the media, well, the staff of the of the Congress. They, they're also uh, people that can bridge the, this uh, distance from from the people. What are your experiences? What can you tell about this Thank discussion? Thank you, Senator. Um, I work with Ghana Center for Democratic Development, a parliamentary monitoring organization. Uh, dedicated to promoting democracy, good governance, and as Honorable rightly said, if democracy would develop, then Parliament has to give out information. The citizens must know exactly what Parliament is doing. And with our engagement with Parliament, we have been working so hard to ensure that Parliament is open, transparent, and responsive to the needs of the people. So talking about how to involve parliamentary service staff in ensuring that parliament is open and data is available for the citizens. We have set up my organization, have actually initiated a network of parliamentary monitoring organizations for Africa. So we have come together as uh, parliamentary monitoring organizations and we have been engaging the parliamentary service staff since they play a very key role because even though the information will be there, is the, the head of Hansa department that will have to make it available, the IT department, all of them are parliamentary service staff. So what we did is two weeks ago, uh, the members of the network, that's Parliamentary Monitoring Organization Network, met in Madagascar. And this includes civil society organizations working with parliament and then parliamentary service staff from over 13 African countries. We met and then we exchanged ideas as to how best we can help parliament to be more open and responsive to the needs of the people. So the parliamentary service staff also had opportunity to let us know some of the challenges that they are facing, some of the things that they don't understand, and that actually gave us opportunity to educate them, sensitize them on what is really happening. For instance, I will speak to the Open Parliament Declaration, uh, Declaration on the uh, uh, Parliamentary Openness. Even though uh, IPU has signed on or endorsed this declaration, majority of parliaments in Africa are really not aware of this particular document, especially Francophone Africa. So we took the opportunity to sensitize them on this document so that they will also be aware of how they can work hard to support parliament to be open. Again, there is some challenges that we have, and this has to do specifically, I will speak to Ghana, if we want parliament to be more open, because parliament is for the people, then activities of parliament, information of parliament should be accessible by the people, as we've heard from the two uh, uh, my colleagues. But in Ghana, the hazard, which is the verbatim recordings of parliament proceedings, is in the form of hard copies, just in parliament. So parliament is situated in Accra. If I am in Kumasi, another town in Ghana, and I need to know exactly what my member of parliament said on a particular issue that was put before the house. I need to take a car from Kumasi, come to Accra, to parliament house before I can have access to. And that is one thing we are working with the parliament of Ghana to change so that the hazard will be available on the website 
So just a click of a button, everywhere you are, you can have access to that information. Is there a bill on access to information and transparency or open data in Ghana? And currently, no. We have a bill before the House, and uh, it has passed to the committee level. Is currently uh, ready for them to debate on, so we don't have uh, access to a uh, right to information law in Ghana. But I would say even though we don't have, Parliament has worked in such a way that it, it has become more open to the people, except that there are a few challenges, as I've stated about the hazard issue, for instance. If I'm a visually impaired person, how do I assess the hazard if it's in the form of hard copy? It has to be soft so that there is a software that I can use so that I can also have access to that information. Again, committee sittings are not open to the public. And at times, as parliamentary monitoring organizations, we have a challenge when we come out with assessments of performance of parliament as an institution or performance of individual members of parliament. Then they are not happy with us because they think they are doing a lot at the committee level. Yes, you are doing a lot at the committee level. The people are not privy to what you are doing. So it's one thing that we have engaged the parliament on so that committee sittings will be open, so that the citizens will have opportunity to witness exactly what my member of parliament said on a particular issue, so that I will know that, yes, my MP is working. So these are some of the things that we have also taken it up with the parliament. Currently, we have engaged with them to review the standing orders they have, and we have a draft. We are here to uh, engage them so that a uh, committee of the whole can accept it and then we endorse it so that the committee sittings will be open to the public. And then the hands that also will be uh, on the parliamentary website so that citizens can have access to all this important data. Well, thank you, Regina. Very interesting experience. And finally, our last but not least uh, panelist Scott Hopley from NDI. You have a lot of experience. You've been working in these areas and NDI all over the world. Probably you can tell us what we've been speaking, the, the relevance of uh, uh, access to information, open data, the use of technology in parliament and in the political process to strengthen democracy or seen in the other way. Uh, what's the damage to democracy if parliaments do not uh, do the, the things that everybody expects them in this updating of technology and uh, openness? Yeah, I guess I'd say a, a few things. I think, you know, for this open data community here, I think there's two reasons why this issue is important. Um, one, you know, people will talk about the open data movement um, and what it's been able to deliver, where it's, it's fallen short. And I think you know, it's important that open data be more than just providing data about services and citizens as consumers of data, but also kind of treating citizens as citizens and making sure that the type of data that's made available also has a political transformative impact. I'd also say, though, one, as we've worked with parliaments on issues of, of openness, Kind of a side benefit of that that's also important for the open data community is that um, as members of parliament begin to engage in issues of openness, they begin to understand these concepts with respect to government as well. Sometimes, you know, you'd have an enlightened government that puts in place a progressive policy with respect to open data, maybe a, you know, a, a portal that makes uh, government information very accessible. Another government then comes in after the election and, and advocates have to kind of start from scratch. I think one element of this open parliament movement is, is also to build kind of policy literacy for MPs on, on what does open government look like? How do we change our societies? I think parliaments are struggling. They're very tradition bound institutions. Uh, some parliaments, they wear wigs still, uh, so they're very, they're very rooted in the past. Um, and our societies are changing so rapidly. Uh, someone has referenced, you know, we have citizens talking to government or parliament with 21st century tools, parliaments listening with 20th century technology, and responding with 19th century processes. And I think parliaments recognize that they have to update their methods of engaging with citizens. And there's lots of experimentation going on, 
but not a lot of answers. So in Ghana, for example, the committee is using WhatsApp uh, to take uh, input from citizens. Is that working? Is it not? I think there's a lot of experimentation, but we're still trying to address some of these core problems. And I think in some ways, and maybe this is a topic for discussion, uh, the changes in society have made the job of parliament more difficult in terms of complexity, in, in terms of transparency. This group treats transparency as an, uh, a um, kind of an undiluted good, and it is in some ways, but it's very hard to negotiate compromise in public. You can't negotiate a peace deal uh, in front of cameras. Uh, the more transparent our institutions are, the more people talk to the cameras rather than to each other. Uh, the more posturing there is rather than uh, perhaps compromise and policy debate. There's stuff that's been written about how the digital society can polarize politics because people have access to a billion sources of information. They'll engage with those sources of information that reconfirm their existing worldview. So they're not talking with people on the other side of the political aisle. They're talking with people that share their worldview, which makes politics more difficult. So I think it's an interesting time for parliaments. There's a lot of new things that are being tried. But I think going back to what you said, uh, Honorable Preston, that, that there is a real need to rapidly scale up the amount of sharing of what works, what doesn't. Because you know, I think the public is losing faith in, in many ways with their institutions that sometimes are viewed as out of touch. And it's a, it's a collective challenge. And I think one great thing about OGP, for example, is a mechanism. It treats this not as a problem just of parliaments, but a problem that's shared between civil society, parliaments, and the citizenry as a whole. Because it's not, it's not just something that parliament is doing wrong. It's something we all need to figure out together and work collaboratively to solve. Could you tell us a little bit more on your experiences of these networks of parliamentary uh, members of parliament or, or congresses vis-a-vis -vis, uh, civil society? Can this uh, be a, a way of uh, adapting or helping parliament to fulfill their role? I mean, I think so. I think there's a lot of discussion about kind of this idea of co-creation and how do we kind of not just hold people accountable for whether they passed a good law or not, but are there new ways to kind of develop things collaboratively? And I think you're seeing some evidence of that. Uh, there was reference to kind of cell phones uh, and landlines. Um, you know, I, I think because parliaments are very tradition bound, particularly in long established democracies, there are to a certain extent the landlines of democracy and you have kind of cell phone kind of leapfrogging in many new or restored democracies where they're experimenting with things. Uh, the Brazilian Congress has a hacker lab in the parliament building, so not just a media center, but a uh, space for hackers to work with uh, members of parliament on how to kind of uh, solve constituent problems using data and, and apps and technology. Uh, there, uh, you know, are interesting methods of of making information understandable. It's it, we we talk too much sometimes about access. That's step one, but it's it doesn't achieve much unless people have the tools to actually make sense of that information. So, uh, you know, my society in the UK and a number of groups that have worked with them do a great job of translating parliamentary information into things that are relevant to people. So not, you know, member of parliament X passed amendment 103 to uh, House Bill 542, but this MP strongly supports uh, climate change mitigation efforts uh, is opposed to, you know, and it translates it into a language that Chakshu's mother can understand. And I think that's something we need to work on as well. Thank you, Scott. I think we have time to a, a small round of one to two minutes to make comments, cross comments, and then we will open the micro to the people. How about that? Sure. Joan? Sure. I mean, I'll start off and I'll go a little further with what was just said. Um, 
we can ask for and, and demand. I think that we can clearly say that people are demanding the access. Um, to what end? We'll find out when the access is all there. When, when, when people are actually, you know, and when is enough enough? We, we don't know. You know, I, I said in my comments, um, it's not about the quantity. It's about getting good factual data so you can make that, like the last statement you just made of um, what does that member of parliament stand for? Not clinically, did he vote yes or no or she vote yes or no? So it's, it's, it's very important that we have in our minds at least a pathway to what success is. I think that will change as technology comes forward. If I could just very quickly say, I think when I started this job, 80, 90% of all the communication I had with constituents was written communication. They'd write me a letter. At some point in the future, I would write them a letter back. Um, that wouldn't be 5% of communication now. Um, it, it, it's far more um, larger if from an electronic point of view, for sure. From a verbal point of view, whether it's a you know on voicemail or or or, or in one of the other um, uh, communication systems, um, and it's far it's far quicker. I would I would suggest I now have probably 300 interactions with with constituents on an average day or can, whereas in the past it might have been that stack of letters was there for a couple of days before I got to the stack of letters and did the the responses. It's it's it, it, those that want to know tend to get the answer a lot quicker now than it used to happen. But that, that does, that's done nothing but fuel a demand for quicker and more. And so we'll have to continue to work through the technologies to make that work. Thank you. Buka, what would yeah. you say? I, I saw that Scott wanted to say oh, something. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to add that, that, you know, and I think the, the challenges that you face in Canada in a lot of parliaments that, that really lack basic resources, the task for them just has become exponentially harder. I mean, uh, the volume of demands has increased. In many parliaments, they need to respond to that with maybe a half-time staff person, two or three staff people, and kind of the demand continues to grow. Yeah, you're, okay. very, you're, you're very right. Because, for example, when we, um, we have uh, visited the uh, um, House of Commons in the UK, and we learned there that, for example, they have 100 people working only on uh, Hansard. So, and when you compare that with Serbia, we have like six, seven people working there. So, it's about the demands and about uh, you know like the the uh, capacity of the parliaments. Um, and we have to face with that, that, for example, our parliament is understaffed. So that's the big issue for for this great demand that comes from the society. Um, I would echo what, what you just said, and I think um, that the crucial thing is education. And I think that all stakeholders in this process need to, to work on, on uh, education, like uh, educate ourselves on why do we need data, how to use data, how to help citizens to, to use data, and then to, you know, like, become more engaged in these processes. So, and I think that the key word for, for working with parliaments in today's world is patience, because <laughs> otherwise yeah, we will, you know, like, give up somewhere in between. Okay. Jack Stu. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to pick up uh, the thread of something that Regina said, and I think it's uh, Scott responded to it. Uh, uh, so, uh, and Scott, you know, maybe put it way more elegantly than I can. But if I put it crudely, uh, the question is, should all parliamentary information be made, you know, available? Right? Uh, and uh, uh, if, if yes, yes, that's a question, right? So because if you speak to the institutions of parliament, you know, parliamentary staffers would tell you that there's a reason as to why uh, committee deliberations, right, are not open, right? And that's what Scott was alluding to. If you need to build a consensus on a piece of legislation or a policy, uh, you don't want, uh, you know, a hundred eyes watching, right, as to what positions people are taking. Because sometimes they may take positions contrary to ideology, right, because they think it's right, right? Uh, we may agree with it, we may disagree with it, but sometimes there is a via media, right? Sometimes there is a way of saying, oh, you know what? Uh, okay, you don't want to open up deliberations, but at least make sure that evidentiary hearings are open to public, 
right? You can take evidence in public and let them deliberate in private. So I think there are solutions that need to be found out to some of these questions because uh, uh, they are complex questions. Uh, Scott talked about uh, correspondence between constituents and members of parliament. Uh, you can open them up, right? Uh, if you open them up in India, uh, the first thing that would happen is a member of parliament is going to say, listen, one, I just get one you know, staffer to man my entire office. Uh, I can't respond to letters, uh, leave alone, you know, making, scanning them and, you know, having the text uploaded. Uh, so, uh, you know, what is the response mechanism that needs to exist on the side of institutions when they start opening up uh, information? Uh, sometimes uh, uh, opening up information, and I, uh, and I don't say that information shouldn't be opened up, uh, I think that uh, sometimes opening up information has intended and unintended consequences, right? Uh, you could open up uh, information and suddenly realize uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the way the information is being used uh, uh, or, or the intent of opening up that information is not fully satisfied. Uh, uh, there are privacy concerns. There are concerns about, uh, you know, uh, uh, we had a member of parliament from Ghana uh, who earlier talked about that uh, you know, some of his colleagues were questioning as to uh, uh, do people, when they want parliamentary information opened up, want to know exactly what is the, the suit, the price of the suit that he's wearing. Uh, so there needs to be some kind of uh, an understanding about data, what does need to be opened up, how it needs to be opened up. I think I'll stop there. There's this problem, uh, as, as Joe, I receive also now different correspondence. It was written then, but now it's uh, through the mail, and you receive it through the yeah. telephone. So I started receiving so much uh, letters with the system that I asked my secretary to open my mail, so she works on it. So I have to ask people don't to send me personal letters because <laughs> somebody, uh, else somebody else might be aware of what's going on, see? Anyway, Regina, what would you say? I, I just want to... Um clarify a bit of um, my, my colleague's point of uh, not uh, all data should be open to, to, to the citizen. I think parliament is for the people. Parliamentary information is meant for the people. When we're talking about private issues, that's di different. But parliamentary information, and I think citizens will be more happy to know the position of their members of parliament on a particular issue. So Open up committee meetings is, is for me, and I think um, in my interaction uh, with members of parliament, they admit because a lot of the work are done at the committee level. The citizens are just open to what happens on the floor of the house. So if I have to assess my members of parliament, and I can share a, a very uh, a, a nasty experience. Uh, one member of parliament lost his primaries just because there was a rating about members of parliament, those who have been speaking on the floor of the house, because that's what we see. So we rated them, and then he performed badly. The citizen says, no, you, you, we send you to parliament, you don't even perform. And he lost. So they themselves admit that because most of the work are done at the committee level, it would be more appropriate for the citizens to be privy to the work that they do at the committee level. So that's opening up such uh, uh, meetings for me, and I think uh, if we really want parliament to be open, then that is a very critical area that we need to take a look at. But I just say that also, I think, you know, there are opportunities here that need to be kind of focused on as well. Kind of there are some solutions that have been piloted that kind of address some of the challenges that have been raised. So, you know, a lot of MPs will talk about the stack of uh, questions and correspondence and emails that they need to respond to. Um, one parliamentary monitoring organization in Germany, Abgeordneten Watch, they uh, provide a service to MPs essentially for by aggregating questions, posting the main questions to MPs, the response is then posted in public so that rather than responding to kind of 20, 30 similar questions, they respond to one that's kind of aggregated and it's a service for the MP. It gets their positions out there and it, it, it's, a, it's a way of um, 
kind of better mediating the relationship between citizens and, and MPs. There's also some experimentation with platforms that make contacting MPs easier on the citizen, but also then provide more useful information to the member. So for example, PopVox in the US, um, they, they make it easier for a citizen to send an email to their MP by making it easy for them to understand what bills are currently being debated, you know, what does this amendment actually do? They provide basic information, so making it easier for the, the citizens. They don't have to know who's on what committee. That's all kind of help, the, the, the platform helps the citizen with that. But on the MP side, uh, or the, the member of Congress, rather than kind of a stack of 300 emails in their inbox that you have to go through each one individually, the MP instead gets a dashboard that says, you know, uh, of these uh, kind of uh, constituent interactions, um, you know, X percent deal with these issues, X percent deal with those issues, this, this many from uh, women, these many from men, these many uh, kind of uh, letters or, or emails from people in your district, these many from people outside your district. So there is the potential to make this easier both for citizens and for the MPs, but I think we're still at early days of figuring out how best to do that. Thank you, Scott, and I guess it's time to go on questions of the audience. And I think we have somebody already in micro number four, so please go ahead and then well, we can please uh, identify yourself. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Philip Spencer, um, and my question sort of is rooted in the, the Canadian context. Um, so I open up to all panelists, but it is kind of focused on the Canadian context. Um, first off, about the physical space um, of Parliament. I was uh, traveling last year in, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and had the, the fortunate opportunity to visit their Parliament. Uh, unbeknownst to me, though, this was a, uh, a privilege that wasn't granted to many citizens and our, our, tour, our tour guides or colleagues um, at the NGO we were working with um, made it clear to us that this was something that didn't happen very often. So in terms of open parliaments, um, I think that the physical space um, is super important um, and, you know, I think that the security questions and things like that um, need to be addressed while still maintaining um, the open nature of Parliament. Um, to get on to my question about um, uh, the communication tools that we have available uh, as Parliaments, I think that one um, vastly uh, underutilized tool, uh, at least in the Canadian context, uh, is the television uh, content that's generated within the House of Commons. Um, I think that uh, as a young person, I would be thoroughly engaged by, you know, a sports cast version of, you know, these are the highlights of the House of Commons. Um, and just to kind of a, a tool that's already there and all you need to do is utilize the video editing skills um, that are within the bureaucracy of Canada by all means. Um, so I was just wondering if there's any movements um, within uh, open parliaments to uh, get video content out to citizens um, so that they can engage uh, in the dialogues that are happening uh, within our parliaments. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody can pick up this question? Well, from a, from a Canadian perspective, um, we already have it. Gavel to gavel coverage on CPAC of everything that happens in Parliament and most committees beyond that. Um, uh, and so, and, and trust me, there's people out there that watch it. It's almost, um, it is sports like. Um, I couldn't appear at a committee or, or be on, uh, on debate in the House without my mother phoning me afterwards. So there's always people out there watching it. Um, can it be more exciting? I think that has to do maybe perhaps with the players than the play, but uh, but uh, you know we're trying to give you give it and, uh, and digitalize it. It's now on computer on a live feed all the time too, and we're trying to do all all of those things as rapidly as they become available. Technology finds a new thing tomorrow, and we try to get it in place in as short of time as possible. But uh, and if you could sit there today and um, uh, the number of tweets, 
Facebook postings, whatever it else might be, that happens from their seats in Parliament, parliamentarians from their seats in Parliament now, is an incredible explosion versus where it was just even a couple of years ago. But please, give us your, your, your thoughts on what you'd like to see different. Um, uh, you know, I watch the, uh, the Blue Jays now in uh, that 30-minute game, right? I can't watch the whole game. Can we do Parliament in 30 minutes and only show the exciting parts? Uh, maybe it's not 30 minutes long then. Um, but, you know, yeah, by all means. I just said Thank you. Are, uh, Scott? I was just going to say there are some tools out there that maybe are moving in that direction. Uh, there's a, a group called Granicus that does uh, links all of the, the uh, motions or the kind of the answer directly to the video feed. So if you kind of see the order paper for parliament or kind of a, a voting record, you can kind of click and just go to that video. So it, it helps you navigate to the parts that are of interest to you. There's also experimentation with um, citizens just recording a video message on their phone and then sending that to their MP as a more personalized way of communicating with MPs. So I think there are things that are moving in that direction. Chuck, I, so, uh, I wanted to pick up the first part of your question uh, about access to the physical space of parliament. Uh, you're right, uh, uh, the, the, the situation in uh, Bangladesh uh, you know, maybe it's a little better in India, but basically uh, accessing uh, the parliament gallery would require you to get a pass from a member of parliament. You can't sit for an entire day. You'll be slotted in for an hour of not your choosing. Uh, you can't cross your legs in the gallery. I mean, there are, uh, parliaments are rooted in tradition, <laughs> right? Uh, so I, I think it's uh, extremely important to make the space of parliament accessible. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, we were speaking to a number of Canadian members of parliament and they told us that there was yoga Wednesday outside yeah. the Canadian parliament. Uh, would never happen in my country, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was Wednesday. The weather was good. But, uh, uh, but, but I think the idea is, uh, again, uh, uh, parliaments are uh, institutions uh, of tradition. Uh, and somewhere down the line, if they can break down uh, some part of that formality and be a little more accessible, I think it will be definitely useful. We have another question. Mike, too. Hi, my name is Wojtek. I work in the Canadian nonprofit sector. Um, before, I, I just wanted to give a quick background on my question. Um, my organization has recently tried to sort of advocate against a certain legislation in the parliament. And we developed a tool that allowed us to, to contact uh, well over, we ended up sending over 30,000 emails to members of parliament, members of Senate. Um, and, uh, you know, we developed easy to use dashboards for citizens to understand uh, where different members of parliament stand on different or, you know, given subject. Um, my question is, in a world, in a political culture where the information about specific members of parliament, about the specific legislations and their stances, on said legislation, when that is easily accessible to the citizens. It's not mediated just by media. There are civil organizations that focus on that. And if in that culture there is an easy to use you know, ways for citizens to contact their member of parliament, the missing piece currently is the fact that the citizens cannot actually influence the outcome. My question there is then, does this age of data proliferation, of, of easily accessible information, does that, where is the room for political parties? And this, uh, this goes back to what, uh, what I said before, when it's so much, so much easier to wrap one's mind around a specific policy, um, does this sort of indicate that we are moving towards a policy-centric rather than party-centric uh, system? Thank you. Oh, I Check, Shui. I'm sorry, Vijay. Okay. Uh, uh, the role of political parties, if you can directly reach members of parliament, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, leave it uh, to Scott to answer in the Canadian context, but uh, in India, uh, political parties will always have a role because uh, currently we have a system of whips. Uh, so the party whips uh, send you a text or a WhatsApp and say, vote yes at this piece of legislation at this time. Uh, you don't vote yes, you lose your seat, right? Uh, uh, we don't have a we don't have a concept of free votes. Uh, uh, other cultures do free votes, uh, 
but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, ease of access of information about where people stand, uh, what they've been doing, kind of levels the playing field for citizens. Uh, you know, I no longer need to be a political junkie uh, to start advocating for things that I believe in, right? Uh, and I think uh, uh, availability of this data, uh, you know, uh, empowers citizens to a greater extent. Uh, so if it does come at a cost to political parties, uh, uh, why not? Okay. Yeah, um, I just uh, follow uh, what what we heard. Like in in my country, it's too much of political parties involved in parliamentary uh, work. So it's about uh, electoral system. So unfortunately, um, I, I can say that our members of parliament are rather a machinery of political parties. You know, like so. I would love to see uh, MPs who are voting against. Uh, what actually party web said, uh, rather than you know, like having them, uh, having political parties so influenced in the in the work of the of the work of the parliament. Scott, part of this question is because citizens then try and engage, and then members still vote whatever the party line is, that that can erode over time, kind of then. The, how citizens feel about engaging with this party, their parties, and there is evidence to kind of, you know, there's been a rise in social movements. People are engaging through civil society organizations or social protest politics in some cases, new parties in some cases because they're they're uh, frustrated with the traditional political parties uh, and how they operate. I think you are also seeing some experimentation within parties about new ways of consultation. There are, for example, a lot has been written about the liquid democracy kind of approach with the German Pirate Party and others. But you know, I think there are elements of that that are starting to, to catch on um, and ways that parties can consult their members. And I think the ones that do that um, likely you know, will, will uh, see a benefit to that. I think you know, Chakshu mentioned early on kind of the common man party in, in India, which didn't exist in 2012 and now holds, I think, 66 of 73 seats in the uh, New Delhi legislature, a huge majority. And I think that's because they've used social media, the internet, these new tools to engage citizens in new ways and to kind of help them feel that they're, they're having a, a voice and an impact that, that, that traditional parties sometimes haven't been able to create that, that feeling that their, their voice matters. Look, uh, just to add to Scott's point, uh, uh, the political parties which poll their members of parliament on specific issues, uh, 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 in the Indian exp uh, experience has been that there's been one political party which has tried to get in feedback from people Right, uh, either through their legislators or directly, have has had a better, you know, uh, chance in convincing people on specific issues. So, what, what's going on in, uh, in several countries that uh, people will vote for for those MPs that are consistent with uh, a policy, because people are more inclined to vote for person rather for parties. So this is also uh, making uh, MPs aware that their duty is not only with the party, but mainly with the people. And this is a strong switch which is weakening parties in a way, but it's uh, a way that people is making their self being heard uh, from their MPs. Well, I think we've come to an end. Uh, I, I just wanted to make a final remark related to the relevance of open data to parliamentary openness. Uh, giving you an example, last week we approved in a uh, committee in the Chilean Senate related to the new form of doing assets and interest declaration. The, the main point is that this uh, new uh, asset declaration, which is quite exhaustive, will be done in, in an open data format, which means that everybody not only can be, can, can access this information, 
but also can analyze it, can reuse it the way anybody wants. And this will bound about 13 public officials of different branches, executive, legislative, judiciary, courts, and so on. So this is going to be a, a, a very interesting experience. It will help a lot to avoid, to prevent conflicts of interest. And it will be a way of tracking also traf uh, traffic of influence or other uh, things that are usually, uh, or not usually, but they tend to happen uh, with more frequency than one would like in uh, the public sphere, uh, which is something that, uh, sure, the CSOs will take a lot of profit because they will be able now to uh, do some more specific research that with time will make, uh, I'm sure, uh, it will give interesting data. So uh, it's a way of uh, making uh, parliaments aware of their responsibility, preventing corruption, and at the same time making people uh, having the chance to access to the real information of all the people that's ruling a country. So, so much for uh, this uh, uh, relevant issue, and I want to ask you to give our panelists a strong and cheerful applause because they, they deserve it. Thank you.